been asked to say a few words on sexual magic or the use of sexuality in combination with spirituality. Well, this is an oversimplified topic if you just say it is good or it is bad. Many religions do have such statements. They often say that um, sexuality and relationships for that matter are just a form of worldly attachment and they are distracting you from uh, your spiritual life, from the divine, from duties, because they are of a lower vibration. Others are saying that sexuality is in essence a form of love and that love is the essence of spiritual development and of spiritual growth and therefore it is a very good and positive thing. Unfortunately, the truth, as far as I can see it, is not that black and white that it is good or bad. It's rather an intricate matter because sexuality itself consists of a lot of different parts and all these different parts can have beneficial or detrimental effects upon how they are being applied. So let's start with analyzing a little bit the growth of sexuality in combination with spirituality. If we start looking at very old cultures, very old cultures were matriarchal cultures. And as far as I have been able to uh, discern, uh, they were harem-like structures, but the women were the harem holders. So the women would select men. The women were seen as essential because they were fertile, they could bring forth children and therefore they were the essence of survival of the people. Without children, no people. And humanity was very often on the brink of surviving or perishing. Those were hard times with a harsh climate, many predators. Humanity still had not developed a lot of tools and humans as an animal are a relatively weak and slow animal. So it all revolved around the women and their choices and of course the competition between women because where there's power there tends to be competition and a striving for the power and the men were just going along with it and it's of course very nice for a man to be selected to yeah, be a father of the next generation to help continue humanity. The spiritual aspect of it was also very much that the woman was seen as the divine which was served by man and very similar to the um, Celtic tradition in which uh, the passing of the seasons is explained by there being a young lover for the woman. The woman itself is eternal, just like nature and the world is eternal. But by the fiery sun, the young lover appearing in her life, she's brought to bloom. She can really develop herself, show all her powers and blossom. And when eventually the man leaves again, then again she goes back into a passive state, goes back into winter. And such it was. Men were, in a way, used as inspiration for women to continue their cycles, to continue their leadership of the people. But in the same way, now, we still need that type of inspiration. Every leader needs to have that ideal, that person for whom they are willing to do it all. But the difference is that nowadays leaders tend to be men more often than women. But women can also fulfill the role of being an inspiration to a man, just like a man can be an inspiration to a woman. Both are possible. If we go more deeply into the spiritual practices of that time, women were not so much individualized 
humanity was not so much individualized. People saw themselves much more as part of their family, part of their tribe, of their people. And as such, also there was no real division by between the divine and the incarnate. There was no conception of original sin and casting being down from paradise or from heaven. People considered the divine to be all around them. They considered themselves to be a manifestation of the divine. And the act of sexuality, of love, was in a way of the divine making love to the divine. There was no judgment there. It was just considered an act of stimulation of two parts of the divine meeting and thereby co-creating an experience and possibly also offspring. So the joining at those times was not merely a very instinctual thing but also a very spiritual thing and something to be done in a specific place or which was often one which had a religious significance. So there are places in nature still which are places of fertility, of joining sexually with each other and with the divine. This tradition, however, became replaced as people started to become more individualized and that we started to develop more of an inkling of value, of money, you could say. And partners were seen to have a certain value, to be equivalent to a certain amount. And from this idea also slavery arose. And of course, besides working slaves to work the fields, wise slaves to teach your children, um, there were also slaves which were chosen for their beauty, for their elegance or attractiveness. And now we enter into a very different type also of sexuality, where sexuality is not so much about serving your partner or meeting the divine in your partner, but much more about your own power, your own ownership, um, how it in a way feeds your ego to have a stronger slave or to have a more pretty slave or to have a younger slave. And in the same way, we are still trying often to buy partners by giving our time, by giving our attention, by giving gifts, by supporting them. And ultimately it is a trade. How much are you paying? And instead of paying to some master to buy the slave off, the lover is both the slave and the master. So you're in a way bribing the master to buy the slave with your attention, with your love, with your care, with your affection. And this is a completely different system of sexuality where the, you know, the consummation of sexuality is seen as yeah, your just reward for your efforts. And ultimately it's also compared how much am I paying? How much am I getting? Is it worth it? So rather than looking really for a unity with the divine, it is more of an exchange of trying to get something for something. It's much more of a mercantile attitude towards sexuality. Spiritually speaking, the power of sexuality is not so much in the act itself but it's much more in your ability to persevere, to understand the other person's need, to understand your own power over that other person. So yes there is a development and there is much more a development of self, of your own power, of your own skill, of your own uh, ability also to be a valuable lover a valuable asset to your partner. 
So it is about increasing your self-worth and about becoming a better merchant in the human interaction game. So there is development, but it is not a development towards the divine itself directly. It's more indirectly by improving yourself that you are able to achieve higher states of awareness. So a different type of sexuality altogether. When we get to the modern age, we find that there are now two prevailing currents in sexuality. Um, one of them is that the sexuality is in a way about um, giving yourself space, giving yourself freedom, allowing yourself to experience love and support. So that the lover is in a way a catalyst for your own development. And this can be done in a tantric fashion, this can also be done in a shamanistic fashion. In a shamanistic fashion it is in a way very playful because you allow um, other powers who would like to develop themselves, who would like to incarnate themselves, to do so by using your body. And for your partner, it is the same. So, for instance, if um, I have a power animal like bear or rabbit or snake, and or some ancestral guides or some other spirit guides, uh, maybe friends who have passed on, and they still want to manifest themselves, they want to incarnate their power, then by being loved, by being supported, by being stimulated, my energy body can strengthen and a lot of change, a lot of manifestation, a lot of growth can happen. And by all the stimulation I'm receiving from my partner, the spirit which resides with me also gets the benefit of all this life force, of this increased flow, of this in a way, energy of passion, fires of passion. And the animal can then mature its energy body so that it enters into my body as, in a way, a child and it leaves after the act as a much more mature being, a more powerful and energized being. And in return, I partake of its evolution, of its growth. Because while it is here, it is maturing its powers, it is maturing its consciousness by the benefit of the life force. And it drags me along in its process of maturation, of growth, of development. So we join with the spirit and both the body and the spirit are supported by the loved one and is often a mutually beneficial exchange because the loved one is doing a similar thing with their spirit guides and both of you enter or leave enriched by the experience. This is very much the shamanic method. The tantric method is in a way a similar or akin I could say to this. In the tantric method it is much more about stimulating the spirit directly and with that I mean your own spirit, not your spirit guides. And it is about being able to stimulate the highest part of the other person's spirit. So you're not trying to stimulate merely their lust but you're trying to activate the entirety of the other being. So, of course, their centers of lust, but also their centers of love, of cognition, of realization, of spiritual realization. So it's about having a lot of attention and about using that attention to nourish the other person, to love, to respect, to connect to the other person, as many levels as possible and supporting them, loving them, inviting them to grow on as many levels as possible. So the tantric method is much more, you could say, individualized 
um, but it's also a lot harder in a way. It's a more complex technique which requires a lot more of your awareness to carry it out well. And it's very easy also if both high and low energies are available that the low energies will quickly become dominant and overwhelm the consciousness. So the art of Tantra it's also very much the art of not allowing yourself to be overwhelmed but by keeping a level head in a way or a level focus so that you can really experience your loved one in his or her entirety instead of just the physical aspect of it. So these are two spiritual traditions which really embrace the sexuality. And in a way also you could say the Greek Roman tradition also embraces sexuality but on a more limited scale. So on the opposite side of the aisle you have um, groups which are more or less policing sexuality, which are saying like, well, sexuality is all fine and good, but there's a lot of danger to it. The danger of attachment that, in a way, instead of looking and seeing directly the path to the divine ahead of you, you will see your loved one, your children, your family, and you won't be looking at God anymore, you will be looking at people. And these people are ultimately distractions. They're lower energies, they're lower beings. And if you spend all your time on them, then you are not spending it on higher beings. A very true statement. And they basically claim that um, while sexuality is necessary for the continuation of the species, it is in a way something which should be diminished in its power, diminished in its role. Because the ultimate is your union with the divine. And this is also true. It is also a very correct path of development. But we have to realize that the union with the divine is not always as easy to achieve and that we need to be ready to achieve such a union with the Divine. And without the readiness, trying to walk such a path is ultimately frustration. The essence of it is that it is a ladder. And at the lowest rungs of the ladder we have our simple animal instincts, uh, and no more, no less. It is just hormones. A little bit above that we get lust, we get sensual pleasures, uh, we get excitement, we get thrills, we get um, also still quite physical feelings. But it's already more complex, it's already higher. So we're climbing the ladder of love, of sexuality. Above that we start to get empathy, uh, that we start caring for each other, that we start to feel that the other person is a part of us, a part of our lives. And how we see the other person becomes more and more rich, more and more complete, instead of just seeing that they are attractive to us on a physical level, we start realizing our emotional compatibility, our cultural compatibility. Do we have the same hobbies? Do we have the same um, interests? Do we stimulate each other intellectually? And so the love is growing to encompass more and more and more. But it's still on a very human level. Ultimately that love can also get bigger. That you stop seeing the other person for who they are right now. But you start loving their divine spirit, their soul, if you would. That you start falling in love with the soul, that you start to see the seed from which all these other things you love has sprouted, from which the body, the emotions, the personality, everything is coming from. So your love starts becoming bigger and deeper and deeper. And once you are able 
to love another person's soul, then you start to be able to really go into a more transcendental type of love and really start to have love for disembodied beings which are purely soul. What is a god or a goddess, an angel or even the creator itself, if not the essence of being? So if we attempt to have this almost celibate type of relationship so that we can have a relationship with the divine without having yet developed the ability to love the soul of not just one other person but of all other people then we're getting ahead of ourselves we first need to start climbing this ladder we need to realize what level is our love at at the moment and what is the next step on this level of love and slowly our capacity to love will start to grow and will start to develop and mature so celibacy is not the beginning of spiritual relationships it is the natural culmination of a spiritual relationship where there is no more need for the lower forms of love because you can be satisfied with the higher forms of love, the adoration of the divine, the adoration of the spirit. So I want to say also a little bit about the darker side of sexual magic. One of the things which can, uh, can happen is that sexuality is seen very much as a symbol of power because ultimately this is the most private part of our being except for my spirit so thoughts are shared quite rapidly quite easily they're usually not that private feelings emotions they're usually only shared with loved ones when a person is comfortable enough the physical body is usually not shared very easily People are rather cautious with sharing their bodies with other people. And the spirit is, of course, the ultimate part of self, which is the most protected, like shells of an onion. And the ability to reach deeper parts, to control deeper parts of another being, is also a little bit of a status symbol. Like, I'm not the person she merely talks to, she has feelings for me. We care for each other then you're more important and if you're able to kiss and to hug then you're even more important so it can not can become about importance about a person's self-importance which they try to prove by being able to go into deeper layers of another person person's space and there can be very strong social aspects to this too. There can be emotional blackmail, which is used as a tool for penetrating a person's emotional space. There can also be a lot of group pressure, both of members of the same sex or members of an opposite sex. It's important to realize that these impulses, you could say these desire for a career, for being more important, um, of these ambitions are themselves normal. However, it is not normal for you to be the career path that somebody else walks upon. Because ultimately you don't want to be just a stepping stone for the other person. You generally don't want to be just a little experiment or a tool for entertainment you want to be more than that if you want love some people are quite satisfied with just having sensual pleasures but ultimately the heart is not satisfied the heart wants to achieve a unity and if partners are coming and going at a very rapid rate then you will not be able to adapt 
deeply enough or quickly enough to achieve that level of unity. And one of the problems is then you keep on being hungry for that unity. So you get into a vicious cycle. If you change partners very regularly, then ultimately you will feel unsatisfied and you will think I will need another partner or a different partner or more partners or more sex. But more is not always bringing more satisfaction because you have to choose between quality and quantity. And for every human being, there is a limit to how many partners they can manage in a good way. And for some people, they can barely manage one partner. Even if they have only one person in their life, they cannot manage to really create a good love connection, to really create a good understanding and harmony with that person. For some people, many people, is actually that they can have a few people, like three people, five people, where they really have the space in their, yeah, in their hearts, in their attentions, in their minds, to really feel harmony with them, to really care for them, to really understand them, to really go in a deep, fulfilling relationship with them. And people who go into lots of contacts, like dozens or hundreds, that can also be quite normal to their nature. Maybe they are not able or even desiring to go into that depth of contact. Maybe this is not their, their path. And for them, because they can only get very little out of a contact, they need many contacts. If they would have only one contact, and their ability to get something from that contact is very little, then they will be very unsatisfied. So they need to have those several partners. So ultimately the question, should you be monogamous, should you have a few significant others, or should you have a lot of magnificent others, uh, significant others, depends on your energetic structure and also on the other person's structure. Because if one person is satisfied, the other person is not, then it's a not very even exchange. And ultimately you're in a way taking up space in the other person's emotional room. If for instance I'm a person who needs lots of different lovers and I just grab little bits of stimulation from them, and I'm with a person who is very devoted to me, that person is ultimately going to be starving for my love and attention, which I cannot provide to her. And it would be better for her and more merciful of me to say, for me, it is easy to exchange her for another one. And this will actually set her free to find a person who is more suitable to her, who can satisfy her better. And this is something which is ultimately important. If you are not able to satisfy your significant other, your significant partner, then the relationship is in the best sense doomed, in the worst sense a blockage to your further growth and to your further development. Sexuality is also a method of connecting energies to each other and also of transferring energies. So by having a union with a person who has a superior development to you, it is very stimulating. You do not simply get stimulated on just a physical level, but also on many other levels, including spiritual levels. So it is actually nourishing you to have contact with that person. And that contact can be, of course, very light. You can listen to a lecture, read somebody's book, uh, meditate on somebody's picture. And this is also already a form of intimacy, of making contact and nourishing yourself by attuning to that person's radiance. And if you get closer and closer and ultimately you get into sexual contact with that person, a lot more energies can transfer themselves. And this is also part of the tantric practice of creating as deep and as open a channel between two people as possible. So that can be an optimal exchange. 
What is very important though is that we can in a way shine on each other and thereby nourish each other. But there are also people who use such contact to steal or to get rid of their garbage. And getting rid of garbage is done quite often. It is usually not a conscious thing, it's usually also more of a male thing. Males who are in a way suffering from uh, negative energies, negative emotions, um, when they join with a partner, they tend to see an opportunity to release these things, to get rid of them, because they are in a way constantly in the process of repressing all these negative things or denying them and once there is actually a space to push them into they do that instinctively so many women feel that after they have had sex with a man who's very in a bad state that they feel in a way both energized and unbalanced they feel energized because they receive a lot of energy from that man they feel that the power and the energy of the man is flowing into their bodies but the energy itself is of a very poor quality and that ultimately harms their own circulation so you get a kick out of having the sex and then you get a downer afterwards because first you feel the influx of energy and then you notice that your own energy has become blocked this can lead in especially in women to a sexual addiction just like a cigarette which is giving, calming you down and giving you a good feeling while you're smoking it and after you have stopped smoking it and nicotine levels go down you feel actually more agitated. In the same way having sex with a person who in a way dumps their energetic garbage in you often leads to sexual addiction because the act of the sex is the only way you can still feel good because if you're not having sex you feel yourself confronted with a lot of negative energies, negative emotions, um, negative karma even, of the other person. So, in a way, energetically speaking, safe sex is to have sex with a person who is more or less on the same energetic level as you are, and who is also active in cleaning their own energy bodies, who is in a way keeping their own energy clean, purifying it, harmonizing it, so that the energy you do receive from that person, it may not be as much, but everything you receive will be a blessing to you, will be nourishment to you. So energetic hygiene is very important to have beneficial spiritual sexuality. Thank you for listening, and I hope will benefit and enjoy.